Roxini, visión cumplida. <laughs> I'm going to tell you how I met Roxini. I have a lot of people, I'm, in, I'm in, on Facebook in social media. I know a lot of you know me through that. And Roxini reached out to me through private Facebook. And uh, she was promoting herself. She said, Angelica, I'm following you. I'm a singer songwriter. This is the work I do. And I, she's Dominican, so, <laughs> so we have that in common. Of course, I love all my Latinas, but you know, having a Dominican-American woman uh, reach out to me, and I always wanted to be a singer, by the way. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I saw her stuff, and what I loved about Roxini was the fact that she was doing her own, she, as she calls it, 100% her own PR. And let me tell you, that's not entrepreneurship. I don't know what is. So um, I was, I've been completely and immensely um, thrilled to, to know her. And I really, to want, I really wanted to give her this platform. Because you know, we actually have the power to lift artists like, uh, like Rossini. Rossini is not going to sell her soul. And I respect that about her. Um, I know Rossini uh, was offered a big contract actually with a record company and she refused it because she was not willing to compromise her values and I respect everyone who does that. So thank you, Roxini. So I am thrilled to welcome to the stage our first keynote of the afternoon, a good friend which I have met through social media and met her today in person, Diana Albarran Chicas. And I'm sorry, I need my glasses and I have not gotten them, so I'm gonna to have to put, bring this up. Diana will be sharing with us what's, what are some of the best practices and solutions um, are around advancing the pipeline for young Latinas in STEM. We haven't had a chance in this program to address young Latinas in STEM. So this is our opportunity to do that. Diana was born in Mexico and came to the United States under her parents' vision of a better life for their children. She was the first one in her family to graduate from high school and attend college. And that's a powerful thing, it sounds light. She grew up undocumented until she was a junior in high school and remembers accompanying her parents to the strawberry fields as a child. Diana graduated from MIT with a degree in electrical engineering and is currently the near field range test section manager at SSL, where she is responsible for the company's unique antenna subsystem test facility. And I hope Diana will tell us more about SSL. She's the first Latina in history, in the history of SSL, to hold this position. Diana has been awarded the Estrella Award by the uh, SHIP Silicon Valley Professional Chapter, the Science and Technology Emerging Leader Award by Silicon Valley Latino, the Rising Star awarded by High Tech, named a Latina leader by NBC Latino and Latino Leaders Magazine, featured on 25 Latinas Who Shine in Tech by Latina Magazine, and interviewed by CNET in Espanol. She is the co-founder of Empower Education, Edu Educational Services and the Latinas in STEM Foundation and Listas. Please give a warm welcome to the amazing and awesome Diana Alvarran Chicas. Diana, where are you? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Hi, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon everyone. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, I'm sorry my voice is a little coarse. I've been a little bit sick, but finally on the mends. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank uh, Angelica for inviting me here today, Google for sponsoring this event, and all of you guys for attending and taking the time to be here. It really is a privilege and an honor to be here amongst everybody, all the speakers, ev and everybody that's spoken today, that's contributed to the discussion, and who continues to, to share their wisdom um, here this afternoon. <clears throat> I, I would like to start uh, by taking you through what I like to refer to as my STEM journey. Uh, a little bit about how I am, where I am today, and what led me to be in the position that I am now. Uh, I hope that this really brings some value, especially for the young Latinas in, in the audience today, as to what, what led me to be here amongst all these powerful women today, um, and, and that you can look to similar experiences or even exceed what I have um, been able to accomplish. 
So <clears throat> as Angelica alluded, my journey actually started in Mexico. I was born in a very small town, uh, San Cristobal Guerrero. Uh, it's the southern part of Mexico. And um, that small town has only gotten or, or has only received uh, electricity and uh, water in the last 10 to 15 years. So it, it's a very small rural area uh, where women were not uh, expected to do much other than have children and be spouses to, to their husbands. I, I, I was born there and my father who had relocated to uh, Mexico City um, decided that we were going to relocate to Mexico City as well. He only finished third grade of elementary school, uh, as well as my mother. Um, I don't come from a family that's highly educated even in, in Mexico. And uh, by the grace of God, they were able to learn how to read and write. And um, they are by far some of the most hardworking people that I know. Um, and that's one of the big lessons that I learned from them from a very young age. They, <clears throat> they decided that Mexico City was the best thing. Um, so we relocated from, from San Cristobal Guerrero to Mexico City uh, until my dad in 1986 decided that he was going to go see what was the big thing then called El, El Norte, the North, uh, which was the United States. And so he came undocumented and was here for a year and decided that this was going to be the place where his family was going to live. So he moved back and said, we're selling our home, which my parents had built with their own hands. Uh, we were not affluent, but my father had worked for a Pepsi company for, uh, for a couple of years and held, um, held night shifts there so that he could provide for his family, but decided that <clears throat> that wasn't enough for him. While he was here in 1986, he realized that education was available, something that was really not the case in Mexico City, at least not for me um, as he knew it. So he sold all of our possessions. Um, he sold the house that they had built. He sold everything that they owned. And we moved to the United States in 1987. I came at the age of five. I was undocumented. Um, and I remained undocumented until I was a junior in high school and grew up a very immigrant life. Uh, we, my parents worked two shifts during the week, uh, day and night. Uh, they alternated shifts so that one parent could always look after me. Um, my, <clears throat> my mother, uh, on top of that, also suggested that you know, we should go see and work on the weekends in the fields. So my parents worked in the strawberry fields um, during, during that time. And because there was not enough money to hire a babysitter, I was asked to come with them at 4 AM in the morning. So I would have to wake up every morning, get up with them, and go to the strawberry fields in the dark, whether it was raining, whether, whatever the temperatures were. And it, it became a part of who I was. And to this day, I still see those little green baskets of the strawberries. And I remember where I was, what I was doing, and what it's like to see your parents work day and night um, to, help, to help you and your family um, be better and, and have a better opportunity. So I, <clears throat> I grew up knowing that I, I was undocumented. Uh, which meant that a lot of my time was spent in hiding. Uh, when we first moved to the United States, um, we were told, don't go out after a certain, when there's too much daylight, you should stay in and, um, and make sure that nobody sees you or knows that you're here. Uh, when we first moved to the first home we were here, we shared it with over 20 people. Our room was essentially living and sleeping under a dining room table. So when, when I say that I, I remember what it was like to be an immigrant, I can tell you that I know what it's like to be an immigrant in this country. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. <clears throat> so um, we decided that um, 
that, that I would I, I would just focus on school. My parents were very big on education, and uh, they said, you know, we're gonna have, we're gonna do anything we can for you. And when I was in third grade, my parents were unable to help me with my homework. Um, so what they did was, my mother exchanged her labor. She would clean a neighbor's house in exchange for um, for that neighbor to help me with my homework. So. <clears throat> She was very resourceful. She found a way where there's a will, there's a way. And, and that's always a very constant reminder to me of, of what it meant for them and what they were willing to sacrifice for me. And, and I never took that lightly. <clears throat> uh, my father, um, like I said, even in this, when we first moved to the United States, worked the night shifts. So I saw very little of him except on the weekends when we were out picking strawberries. And, and it, was, it was a difficult time, um, but by the time I was in sixth grade, um, we had finally stopped moving. Between the time that I moved to the United States and by the time I was in sixth grade, I went through six or seven different schools because we were constantly moving, we had to follow the crops wherever they were um, to help sustain ourselves. And it, it, was, it was difficult having to move and relocate, but <clears throat> by sixth grade, my parents were able to get a, um, a home and buy a home, and we decided that, um, that I was going to try to do my best in school. My, my sixth grade teacher, uh, was very important in, in for me because it, he was the one that decided, his name is Mr. Denholm, so I still remember him, decided that um, I was gifted. And that led to being tracked into um, advanced classes from there, from middle school up to high school. High school, I, I did really well because I was associated with with kids whose parents were doctors and lawyers and engineers, so I learned through them how to navigate the college admissions system. Um, if it weren't for that, I would have never had known what FAFSA was, what an application was, what, um, what filling out uh, financial aid forms were either. So <clears throat> in 11th grade, I decided, or I thought I knew that I was going to be an architect. And there was, a summer intern there was a summer program at the University of California of Riverside that exposed me to engineering. And it was there that I learned about engineering. I had never met an engineer, knew what engineering was, or let alone met an engineer before. Uh, but I figured it was important because there was a whole school dedicated to engineering. Um, and, and after that summer program, I came back my senior year and I told my counselor I wanted to be an engineer. And she said, okay, uh, let me look at some schools that are good engineering schools and I will get back to you. Two weeks before the MIT admissions deadline came, she told me, here's MIT, you should apply. I had no idea what MIT was. I never grew up thinking I was going to go to MIT. I just thought I was gonna go to college because hey, everybody else was doing it so I could probably do it too. Um, and to be honest, when they first told me about MIT, I thought it was a lot like ITT tech. Um, and, and, and it sounds very naive, but that was really, that's really where my mind was at that time. Um, and, and very thankfully, I, I was admitted through a lot of hard work, and um, I, I graduated with a degree in electrical engineering, and that was the reason why I did electrical engineering was, as somebody mentioned earlier, I was really good with the A and V equipment, the audiovisual, the VCR, you know, connect everything. Back then, you had the VCR, the speakers, the amplifiers, um, and so I was the tech person. Um, and I figured if I know how to connect this and use them, I should know how to design them and not just consume them. Um, so <clears throat> that led into electrical engineering. My first job was with a small startup called uh, Thermo Life Energy Corporation, who's now moved into technology uh, wear. Um, and after being there for some time, I realized that I had outgrown that company. And that led to the current position that I'm in now at Space Systems Laurel. I have been very fortunate. I've had a lot of help along the way. And uh, it's been a difficult journey 
But what I do want to tell the young people in the audience today is um, <clears throat> students, as students, please focus on science and math. Uh, the technology and engineering can come later, but to have a good foundation and something related to STEM, science and math is important. Uh, you know, make sure that you push yourselves beyond your comfort zones. Attend those science club meetings, those math club meetings, those robotics meetings, and, and do what you can to push yourself beyond what you feel you can do. For the parents, you need to be involved in your children's education. You need to be their advocate. You need to make sure that you understand what it is that your child needs to do to go to college. You need to try to find the resources that you can find for them um, so that they can attend an, a university. And if it's not STEM related, that's perfectly fine, but please make an informed decision with them. For counselors and educators, I am a big believer that I would not be here today if it weren't for my sixth grade teacher and my counselors uh, that pushed me to say that I could be where I am. Please continue to push the students, um, to encourage them, to give them the information that they need, the advice that they need, and the help that they need. And to the corporations and and anybody that's willing to be part of this Latinas in STEM movement, we ask you to please be part of, of it. We've started the Latinas in STEM Foundation where we've gone through five different cities taking the message of what STEM is, why it's important, the work that we've done. We've impacted over 2,200 students. We've impacted over 400 parents and over 500 professionals. So there are organizations like the Latinas and STEM Foundation that are willing to do this work, but we need corporations, we need sponsors, we need volunteers that will help us move these numbers to help improve the Latina and STEM representation. Currently, we only are 2% of the science and engineering workforce and 1% of the computer science workforce. So I'm asking you to please be a part of the movement, help us propel the numbers and increase the numbers. And I would like to leave you with a quote, <clears throat> a favorite quote that I have from Robert F. Kennedy, which is, some people see things as they are and ask why. Others see things, no, hold on, I think I got it wrong. Some people see things and, some people see things and ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. So thank you. <clears throat>